Praise the Lord, everybody. If we could stand tonight. Amen. I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. I'm glad to be here tonight. Amen. I, I, I'm glad that I'm surrounded by people that are hungry for God. I, I'm glad about the teaching of the Word tonight. I'm excited for it. It's challenging me. The Word's pushing me to grow, and it's, it's changing my life. I, I'm glad for the music. I'm glad that I have an opportunity to praise the King, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. There's none like Him. Amen. I'm thankful that it seems that everybody has made it back after the storms. I know we had some damage, but I'm, I'm grateful that he's been faithful to us and he's kept us. He's kept us. Amen. But we're going to have a time of prayer tonight where we're just going to seek the Lord. We're going to go to him. If you have a care, if you have a need, why don't you just make it known by the raising of your hand tonight. Lord, I love you with all of my heart. You're the, you're the one thing that I'm after. It's your presence that I'm hungry for. It's your presence that I crave. God, I believe that you're doing something in each and every person in this place tonight. God, I believe that there is a word from heaven for them tonight. I believe something's going to come through Pastor tonight that, that's important. Lord, that's going to help us, that's going to direct us, that's going to guide us. And I'm just praying for that to be done tonight. God, I, I lift up every sickness tonight in the name of Jesus. Every financial need in the name of Jesus. God, every struggle, God, I pray for the comforter to be with us. I pray for the power and the boldness of the Holy Ghost to go with us. God, I, we're just hungry for you tonight. God, we're not satisfied with where we're at. We're praying for your presence to come down into this place. We're praying for the anointing of the preaching to be in this place tonight, God. I'm praying, Lord, that you're with each and every person through every struggle. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Just praise him for a moment. Come on, there's no one like Jesus. There's no Savior like Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. There's no equal. There's none beside him. He is high and lifted up. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, all of my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. So beautiful. No one washes away sins like Jesus. No one transforms a life like Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Psalm makes me think of, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things back to your remembrance. I think back the Holy Ghost and I can just remember everywhere that he's brought me from. Through the process, through every struggle, every growth. He's been there the whole way. Amen. I'm just so thankful for his presence tonight. Amen. If we could get the ways to give on the board tonight, we're going to go into a time of giving. We have Giveify, PayPal available at riverbendpentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, 1031 Mill Street, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. Bringing up pans are coming out for tithing and offering. And you can text to give at 833-883-9311. Man, Brother Shannon, I don't know what I'd do without you, bro. I'm thankful for that guy. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But if you'll pray this with me tonight. Upon the authority of your word, I have given and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, 
walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. And the church said... Some praise in this house. Thank 
Magnify the Lord with me. Magnify the Lord. Open up your mouth, not just your hands. Open up your mouth and say, thank you, Jesus. I've got the victory. You've got the victory. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. We're so thankful to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. We missed Sunday due to the storm and the lack of power, but uh, I want to say, you be seated for a few moments. We have uh, how many special speakers? Four. They've graduated from three to four. Tell them to all come up here. Stand up here so everybody can look at them. Come on, fellas. We got four of our children going Lay it down for you a few minutes tonight. But before they do, I want to tell you, uh, two Wednesday nights ago, we handed out our envelopes and uh, the $100 envelopes. If you did not get one, we got about 30 that didn't get handed out. So 30 or something like that. And uh, if you want to get one of those, see Sister Meredith, just a one-time $100 offering. And uh, we, that's how we give the she's a move the mission, Mother's Memorial, etc. Um, Sunday morning, Brother Blake is going to be preaching for us. And you don't want to miss that. Amen. And we've had him on the schedule <clears throat> for some time. And also on Sunday, and I didn't ask permission for this, but in this case, I don't have to. Um, I, I don't know if there's many that don't know, but. In the storm, Mom and Jerry lost their house. Big tree in the side yard fell on it and and destroyed it. And uh, we saw a miracle. And before church, I was thinking, if I was ever afraid of storms, I wouldn't be now. You say, well, what in the world? Because I saw God keep my family through the storm. I know some of you struggle with that, but let me tell you, if the storm gets you, something else was going to get you if it didn't. God's able to keep you through the storm. Mama was in the bed, and she woke up with sheetrock falling on her, and uh, it fell into her room, and Marcus was in the other bed, and uh, God got him up out of the bed because that bed smashed flat to the floor under that limb. And uh, Kenley was in the other room, and thankfully she was on the bottom bunk instead of the top bunk because it's metal bunk beds, and that limb crinkled those bunk beds down. And, uh, and I'm very, very thankful that God kept his hand on Mom and Jerry, Marcus, and Kenley. So Sunday, we're going to take up an offering for them, and uh, I want you to be ready. I did, like I said, I didn't ask permission <clears throat> and I don't intend to. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's what this church does. Amen. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, we're thankful for everybody that checked on us, everybody that came and helped. Uh, a lot of people, I don't remember who all. I can't, there were so many coming and going, but you know who you are. We're very, very grateful. Those that called and checked on us. Now, tonight, we're also happy to have Brother and Sister Burns with us so much. Um, he, he asked about coming. First off, you don't ever have to ask again. You have a, you have a, you come anytime. And, uh, but now I'm nervous and scared because he's here. And I pray the Lord let me teach good and then let me teach you good enough that Brother Burns won't be disappointed in me, but uh, they are transitioning, and uh, they just, they're going to be, be staying in Dexter for, uh, uh, I don't know how long, however long they want to, while their children are at camp, and he's going to come here, so thank you for being here for both of you. We love you dearly, very dearly. You've always been wonderful to us, and uh, Brother Burns preached my installation service, the power of an appraisal. I'll never forget it. We, we love you and we give you honor. Thank you for being with us tonight. Sister Casey 
went and invited four preachers to come tonight. And then she told me they were going to be preaching. That's not really how it happened. But these boys have been practicing preaching. And I love it. I love it. Don't you? So this is, this is Brother Rhett, this is Brother Jack, this is Brother Braxton, and this is Brother Alejandro, otherwise known as Angel. I only call him Alejandro because his mama told me I could. But uh, they're going to share something with you tonight. Are you guys ready? Y'all got to preach with them. If somebody says, bless him, Lord, I'm going to come back there and wash your mouth out with soap. All right, let's go. They are really nervous. But I told them it did not have to be long. It can be a thank you, Jesus. But they have been doing so good, so I'm going to let them go. I know y'all know how to do it. Will you go first, Angel? Will you go first, Braxton? Go ahead. He said he'll go first. When I first heard that, I was nervous. I'm like, what? I thought it was just going to be nobody at first, but she said it. Then I let it pro process. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There you go. All right, Jack. Come on, Jack. stuff and I, I wanted to pray for him a lot and look where he is now. Rhett wanted to talk about how he wasn't coming to church for a while, and Jack was a witness to him. So, um, Rhett, how did it make you feel? Well, um, we were, it was like we were at school one day, and at the end of the day, Jack told me, he asked me if I wanted, <coughs> if I wanted to go to church. I said, sure. Then he asked me to go to church again. Then uh, one week he was at his mom's house. Then I went to church. I thought he was going to be here, and he wasn't, but I still had fun, and I was like, hmm, this makes me want to go back to the Lord. And then, and then, next thing I know, I'm over here getting baptized. That's how God sent Jack to bring me back to church. say thank you, Lord, for everything you have done for my life. Uh -huh. That's it. That's it. Yeah, I'm done. 
Braxton wants to shout one more time about time when he was sick. So I was lying in bed. My mom took her hair off her bun. She laid it across my body. She went to start to pray. And immediately, right after she was done, I, I was like, I was like feeling good. And I'm like, I can run a marathon. <laughs> That's great, boys. That's great. Go down and line up across the front. That's wonderful. Come on, Braxton. Y'all did good. All the children, Riverbend kids, come on up here. Riverbend Kids and Riverbend Ignited, come on up, line up across the front. The youth, students, do we have any tonight? Lottie Baby over here, honey. Come over here with the other. We're going to pray for our children, for our students before they go back tonight for their class. You would just reach your hand to him, pray God's covering over him, his blessings on him. Let's pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray for every child that's going to Riverbend Kids. We pray for Sister Casey, pray for Sister Carly, Sister Scarl, that they'll help them. Thankful for what you're doing in their lives. Thankful that they want to share a testimony. They want to share something from you. Thankful that they're growing. I pray, Lord, as the summer comes, let them have a great summer, a safe summer. I pray that they continue to be a blessing and a witness to their friends. I pray for our students, those that aren't at camp tonight. I pray, God, that you'll bless them. I pray that you'll help them keep growing, help them keep having a desire for you, help them to have courage and to stand strong in this day that we live. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, Noah, lead them back, buddy. Everybody else say praise the Lord. What a great feeling in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. We are thankful that all of our people came through the storm unscathed for the most part. Thankful that the Lord kept his hand upon everybody, our community. We were without power for a couple of days. Some others were without power, but we made it. Amen. And, uh, uh, thankful. Tonight, we're going to continue our series. Um, I am starting a part of it. This says part six, but I am not going to get done with it tonight. I'm giving you fair warning up ahead that there's too much to cover. And, uh, but we will be discussing the identity of Jesus Christ. We've learned that a church is really no stronger than the message that it preaches. We have a responsibility to stay true to the doctrine, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.38, salvation, we have it on our wall. We believe in it. And uh, I am thankful for what the Lord is doing here in the church and the growth that we're seeing. And I'm very appreciative of the truth. Does anybody love the truth? Amen. Amen. The book says, buy the truth and sell it not. That means take it in, make it a part of you. And uh, so we, we, uh, we learned early on that just because we have the truth doesn't give us a license to be ugly to anybody. Right. Amen? Right. Doesn't mean you get to carry a club. One, old, one preacher said, walking around with an ax and 238s, chopping and shooting. We don't want to do that <laughs> but because we love people, right? That's where we got last week. The perfect love of God is what makes the doctrine work. The doctrine is no good without the love of God. We don't even have it without the love of God and perfect love. 
perfect love. So they're handing out the handouts, and we uh, we do. Um, Kevin Abernathy called today, and one of his uh, aunts uh, found out she has terminal cancer and like for us to pray. That's why he's not here tonight, and some others are not here for various and sundry reasons. But I'm glad that you're here, and we are indeed going to have a time tonight. Doctrine, a confrontation with the divine will. That's the way Jewish culture observed doctrine. It is bringing us and our carnal thoughts, ideas, and mind into confrontation with God's plan. Amen? Yeah. I'm going to let y'all know something. That man that just walked through that door, Ronnie Sales. (laughs) He's been coming to church here for three years. He likes woodworking and lawn mowing. That's how y'all was watching him like he was walking across the beauty contest floor. <laughs> so I was just making sure y'all knew who that was. Genesis 1, 1 and 2 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, lest we, and I feel like we do, minimize what that says, I want to work backwards from the face of the waters. And assuming that things then are as they are now, there are generally four recognized oceans in the world. The Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian, and the Arctic. These oceans cover 139 million square miles. 139 million square miles. That's just the four oceans. And the Bible says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There is 57.3 million square miles of land on planet Earth. 24.6 million of which is habitable. That comes to those of you that deal more in farm ground. There are 15.7 billion, with a B, billion acres of habitable land on planet Earth. For perspective's sake, the state of Missouri has 68,727 square miles of land. And the Bible says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of of the waters. The sun is 93 million miles from Earth. Neptune, now considered the furthest planet in our solar system, is nearly 3 billion, with a B, miles from Earth. The North Star, which you can see plainly on a good clear night, is 323 light years away from Earth, or roughly 2 billion miles and he made it all he made it all he spoke it all into existence it hangs where he put it it lasts as long as he intended for it to be put there the vast majestic perfectness of it all was no accident. God made it all. God is infinite in his essence, in his planning, his wisdom, his understanding and comprehension. There's no limit to it. There is no beginning and there is no ending of it. Mankind, us, we, out of all of that, we are the only And I feel the Holy Ghost moving, so I might forget it's Wednesday. If I do, y'all just excuse me. Mankind is the only created being made specifically for relationship with God. All of that out there, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the mountains, the trees, the rivers, the streams, and the oceans, they were all created relative 
to man. This world was designed to exist in perfect order with mankind at the center of it all. However, when man fell, he lost his place. That, that is when the bigness of it all became overwhelming to man. He no longer had his God connection through which to filter his grasp of where God had placed him and what God had created him to do and to be. So inside of this marvelous, glorious, stupendously large creation, man was now lost. He no longer had a frame of reference because when man was connected to God, nothing was too big to comprehend. But when man lost his connection to God, everything became too big to comprehend. So in an effort to reconnect, man started making gods from the greatest thing he knew, creation. Paul gives us perhaps the most clear description of this in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 23, when he says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Now, the, the revelation of God after the fall wasn't universally personable. Every person could not, like we can, go and pray and feel the presence of the Lord. Everybody couldn't. But, Brother David, men and women called of God, anointed of God, blessed of God, and heard from God were strategically placed where they could share who God was, what he did, what he wanted to do, and what his will was. And that way, worship was made available to everybody. But you had to hear somebody else's testimony of who God was and what he did. However, there was a problem when these strategic individuals would begin to preach because their message from God involved not only an acknowledgement of who he was, but also submission to who he was. And that was a deal breaker. It was. Because after all, if we're given enough time and enough opportunity, we can do this our way and still beat God in his game. Sure we can. For example, how about the Tower of Babel? The Lord says, see that rainbow? That's a sign of the covenant. I'll never do this again. And the men at Babel said, we better build a tower in case he tries to do this again. What is it about the nature of a human that feel like we can get something over on God? That sounds a little bit elementary, but it's the truth. I, I feel like that, that I can, if, if you give me enough opportunity and give me enough big enough gang and, and get enough people around me, Brother Terrence, I can do anything. It's been that way all through the Bible, Brother David. But look here. Verse 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Everybody knows, everything knows that it didn't get here on its own. We owe our existence to somebody bigger than us. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Here's why. Because when they knew God, 
They glorified him not as God. And here we go, Brother Cody. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Anything you can I contrive against God is empty and it ain't going to work. They became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Now I want you to turn to your neighbor right there and say, don't forget about that darkened heart. Now you see here, Brother Cody, there is a very clear contrast between pride and gratefulness. When you lose gratefulness, pride automatically moves in. And they are very difficult, if not impossible, to coexist within us. Look what verse 22 says. And I want you to think about this, if you can, in the context relational to the world that we live in. Professing themselves to be wise, Telling everybody, telling everybody who would listen how wise they are, they became fools. I'm just going to let that just marinate in your mind for a few minutes. There is no limit to the depths of depravity a human being will sink to when they try to do it their way. And they will come to school, come to work, and come to church and make everybody believe that things couldn't be better. All the while, excuse this term, their lives are going to hell in the proverbial handbasket. Because that's why you have to humble yourself before the Lord and say, step one, ain't got it. I don't have it. I'm not God, and I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing. Look at verse 23. Remember, this is where people got to. Creation was so big, and it was so marvelous, and it was so magnificent. Rather than submit to God, they just started making gods out of creation. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and like birds and like four-footed beasts and creeping things. Man made his own God when the wonders of creation no longer had a standard of reference for him. He couldn't get it without being in relationship with God. Y'all see that? When that connection to God was lost, Man became overwhelmed. And so he decides, the greatest thing I know is this world I live in. That must be my God. So they started making fish, and they started making bulls, and they started making goats, and they started making half people and half fish and half people and half lizard. Just something coming out of somebody's crazy mind and worshiped it. Everybody all right? So, we're talking about the identity of Jesus Christ. Now, we're moving in to the Word. Everybody say the Word. The word. Now, we like to, this is the Word of God. We all agree? The Bible is the Word of God. But the Word's way bigger than just the Bible. Okay? Within the Word are the Logos or the Logos. Within the word was the hugeness of creation. Remember, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Remember that? All of that was in the word first. But also within the word, the same word that brought the magnificent creation also had reconciliation and redemption in it. Now, Brother Nathaniel Wilson says this regarding the Logos or the Word. He said, the Word is the personal proceeding of God 
from eternity. Say that again. The personal proceeding of God from eternity. Remember I taught you several months ago that God is not working from the beginning to the end. He's working from the end back to you. That's why his ways are perfect. Now look here. Here's what he said. The word is the mode of God's being in which he goes forth from himself to meet man. Now, so the word, and I'm going to explain to you where the word comes from, Logos. The word is the way which God reveals himself to man for the purpose of reconciling man to God. Right? right. You believe that? Amen. So God reveals himself to man for the purpose of reconciling man to God. I read something recently and I concur with it. Every word in this book has at its root the purpose of reconciliation. Which is bringing you and I back to the relationship with God for which we were created. Now, there are three major issues with this. The first is man needs to be reconciled or restored to relationship with God. But you or I will not want to be reconciled or restored to relationship with somebody we don't know. So man first has to know God in order to want to be with God. Now the great inhibitor of reconciliation is, somebody said it, go ahead Sister Miss Virginia, sin. Sin is the inhibitor. Sin is what destroyed the relationship between man and God, right? So sin is the inhibitor of reconciliation. And the problem with that is in order for sin to be removed, there has to be a death. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So we have a revelation problem. Everybody say revelation problem. Revelation. We have a connection problem. Say it. Problem. And we have a sin problem. Sin. There has to be an avenue for man to know God, to be reconciled to God, and for the power of sin to be destroyed. Those three things have to happen in order for the will of God for you and I to be manifest in your life. Let's follow John's path in order to prove this and see the solution. John chapter number one, verse number one. In the beginning was the word. Now that's the logos, the logos that I was just telling you about. That's the way God connects to man. Brother Robbie, if he didn't have a plan for connecting with us, we could not comprehend him. Especially since sin separated us. Okay? So, in the beginning was the word. Now everybody, I, I know I'm making you say a lot, like five words already. Everybody say the word. The word. Logos. Logos. Okay. John chapter number one, you got to remember that. In the beginning was the word. So in the beginning there was a plan in the mind of God to let man know who he was. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. We can't move forward until we realize that says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? The same was in the beginning with God. Look at verse 3. All things... So we, here's, I feel Jesus. Y'all feel the Holy Ghost in here? My goodness. 
where we began, Brother Blake, within the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. All things were made by him. And there ain't nothing yeah. on the face of the earth that he didn't make. Right. Nothing that exists, exists without the will of God. There was not anything made that was made without him. Verse 4, here's where we're going to start teaching. Now remember, there are three things we got to have. What is it? Revelation, connection, and remission, atonement. Those three things have to take place. Now we might discuss that atonement needs to come before connection. Because you can't be brought back to God until your sins are remitted. But I'm thankful that sometimes he lets us start knowing him while we're still all messed up. Huh? Sister Stephanie, he don't wait till I start being able to talk about hermeneutics and apologetics and all of that. Sometimes he just lets me walk in here. And somebody say, Jesus loves me, this I know. And, woo! Brother Shannon, they walk into our recovery meeting and they say, I heard this meeting was different, but now that I got here, I know it's different. Because I'm telling you right now, we ain't talented enough, we ain't smart enough, we don't have a nice enough facility, we don't have enough people to be anything without God. It's all in him. It's all in him. Look at here. In him was life. Everybody say life. life. In him was life. Man, it blew my mind when I read this. The word life here, I don't know if y'all ready for this. The word life here has no limitations and is to be understood in its widest sense. I'm reading straight from Ellicott's commentary right now. The life of the body even of organism which we commonly think of as inanimate, so from the smallest of molecules to the largest of created beings, the life of the soul, the life of the spirit, the life in the present, so far as there is communion with the eternal source of life, life in the future, when this idea shall be realized and the communion be complete. This word life is talking about existing and living. Ah, come on now. Y'all got to see it. And I'm not looking for a response, but you got to see this. Everything you miss it in life, you'll find it in Jesus Christ. Everything that's lacking in your life, everything that's lacking in your living, it's in him. Everything that you are missing in your life, it is in him. Everything that you're falling short with, it's in him. Everything that you feel inadequate, everything that you feel low, inferiority, everything you need to be complete is in him. You don't need a new song. You don't need a new sermon. You don't need a new building. You don't need a new car, a new truck, a new wife, or a new husband. You need a revelation of who Jesus is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In him was life. Hear me right now as I tell you. There ain't nobody that exists on their own. There is nothing that exists on its own. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Where's the Tower of Babel today? You don't know. Because it didn't make it. Nothing exists outside of him. And 
the life, all of that was the light of men. Now, I didn't study it out, and I don't have a connection, but if you want to make a little note of it on your notes, you're welcome to study it out. But I feel like there is a powerful connection between what we're talking about right now and John 10 and 10, which says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, kill, and destroy, but I am come. I am come that you might have life. You know, wait just a minute. You know what I just told you was in that life? Everything. But then he said that you might have everything and more of it. More abundantly. Overflowing. Oh my goodness gracious. Revelation flowing in the house right now. Look here. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Here's what that word and helps word studies light means. Especially in terms of its results or what it manifests. Meaning when the light shines on in the darkness, what you see in him was life and the life was the light of men. That takes you from not being able to see, from not having any direction, from being confused. But look here. I love it. Here's this definition for light. Are y'all ready for this? Divine illumination to reveal and impart life through Christ. Look here in verse 5. And the light shineth. I don't want to move on ahead here, but I got to let you know something. I've taught you this. When you get ETH on the end of a verb, it means, think about it. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. What's the scripture telling us right here? In the fullness of time. Born of a woman. Fear not. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. Anybody know what happened right before they started talking? A bright light. This scripture, John chapter 1, verse number 5, you know what it's saying? Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. Verse 5 said, and Jesus came into the world. And the world was dark. And the world was messed up. Now, I don't want you to get messed up by what comprehend. That word comprehend right there doesn't mean come to understand or come, the darkness couldn't understand it. That word right there, comprehend, means the darkness couldn't stop it. When... Somebody's got to realize now, right now, I don't care how dark your life is. I don't care how dark your environment is. I don't care how dark your home is. I don't care how dark your mind is. I don't care how dark your life is. I don't care how dark your relationship is. When Jesus shows up, the darkness can't stop it. The darkness can't keep him out. The darkness will not win. Oh, somebody ought to rejoice in the Holy Ghost right now because when Jesus comes, there is life and there is life and everything I need is in him. I'm telling you right now, 
There are some of us that we're singing the cotton picking hee haw song, gloom and doom and agony on me, and we better shake ourselves out of our stupor and begin to declare the only saving name that was ever given among men. And somebody ought to say Jesus, and then say thank you, Jesus, and then say I love you, Jesus. I've said this before, but if the devil's camped out on your doorstep, you better start praising the Lord. He will either have to leave or join you. Look here. And the light shined in the darkness. Immorality, debauchery, sinfulness, ungodliness. Boy, I wish I could paint a better picture of what I'm thinking right now. CBS, they preach darkness. NBC, they preach darkness. CSNBC, they preach darkness. Fox, they preach darkness. KBSI 23. They preach darkness. KFBS and Kate, they preach darkness. And they'll make you think that we better start come, praying for the Lord to come. Because if the Lord don't come, we ain't going to be able to make it in this much longer. That does not compute with what I'm reading to you from the Word of God. I read in the book of Isaiah, no weapon. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And I'm going to paraphrase the next verse when he said, the enemy doesn't have an anvil or a forge or a factory that he's not using something I made. That's what the book says. He said, I create the built the thing that pumps the coals. He said, if the enemy's making something, he's just using my, oh, he's just using my stuff to do it. You better realize that the enemy don't have nothing to come against you with, that the Lord has already not got a solution. And the darkness can't do nothing about it. All right, let me talk to you for a few minutes. Because kind of like verse 6, 7, and 8, they all go together. Kind of the way I'm bringing it tonight. Verse 6. Uh, oh, Lord Jesus. There was a man. Sent from God. I said there was a man sent from God whose name was John. There was a man sent from God. And that is how your reconciliation begins. Is God sent a man or perhaps a woman into your life? <laughs> Honey, please don't think you came here because it was your idea. Please don't think you came here because you're special or, or you got something that nobody else has. You came here because God sent somebody to you to bring you here. how it begins for all of us. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness. I didn't have time to unpack all this either. But I do believe Jesus did say in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, but you shall receive power, dunamis, dynamite, the ability, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you 
shall be witnesses. Somebody better realize the connection right there and say, and the other thing is, I didn't show up just to this church so my booty could be counted as one of the numbers. I showed up to this church because God needed a witness in my world. You didn't come here to make our numbers bigger. You didn't come here to make people in town talk about us. You came here because your world needed you. Your world needed you to be reconnected to God so you could go out and be a witness. Because you're going to be somebody's man of God. You're going to be somebody's woman of God. you got to believe it. you got to believe it. It ain't all on the preacher. It ain't all on the pastor. It ain't all on the Sunday school teacher. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He came to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Paul said, I don't come with enticing words of man's wisdom. That's why we got to lose the mentality that says, I got to know this and I got to know that. All you got to know is who Jesus is. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. What we got here in 6, 7, and 8 is the picture of the pathway that Jesus Christ chose to reveal himself to the world after he ascended to heaven. A preacher sent from God will come and preach, don't believe on me, but believe on him who's coming after me. I ain't worthy to put his shoes on and tie them up. And I'll baptize you with water under repentance. But he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And I got a little ahead of myself, but here, 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 here. A preacher sent from God will come and preach a message. And you will believe what he says. And when you believe what he says, you will... Obey what he said. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 through 17 says, How shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? I said we have a revelation problem, didn't we? You can't be reconciled to somebody you don't know. So you need somebody to tell you who he is. And what better preacher to tell you who he is than somebody he shows up in? How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And where are they sent from? Hmm? Any ideas? How about the Logos? How about this is a part of God's? plan. Just as much as he said, let there be light, he said, let there be Terrence Tidwell live in Sykeston, Missouri. I think we kind of scared to believe that sometimes. Let me tell you why. It's because we ain't sure we want to move to the light or keep living in the darkness. But look here. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Esaias, Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Here we go. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith what? Faith in him. You know what? We preach about him and him crucified. He reveals himself and we believe. Verse number nine, John chapter number one. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God. He was not that light, 
That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Remember what I told you light was? Divine illumination to reveal and impart life. Look at verse number 10. How in the world can we read this and not realize who Jesus was? He was in the world, and the world was made by him. Sometimes it had happened so much because I got an office now. But before I had an office, I studied at home all the time. And I studied at the dining room table because we ate at the kitchen table. The dining room table was just to be pretty or for me to sit and study. And every now and again, Amanda would come running because she thought something was wrong. Because, Brother Burns, I had read something like he was in the world. And the world was made by him, and revelation just exploded in my mind. And I started going, oh, 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 my goodness gracious, I can't believe. How do people not see that? And I'm hollering yelling at the dining room table. Because that's what the word does when you realize, wait a minute, we preach the truth. We preach the truth. And Jesus Christ was in the world that he created. But the book says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So who Jesus was? He was God. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. I want to have a fit right now because the word is so powerful and beautiful and rich. So he created the world, then he showed up in the world, and They wouldn't receive him. They didn't know him. They didn't recognize him. He came into his own. That's the Jewish people. And his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Which were born. Not of blood. Not of the will of the flesh. Nor of the will of man. But they were born of God. And the word was made flesh. Now what did I tell you the Logos was? What's the purpose of the Logos? For God to reveal himself to man. Cause he. Woo. Cause brother Blake. What I do know. Is just the flicker. Of who he really is. <laughs> he had to make a way. So I could connect with him. He had to make a way. So my finite mind. Could connect with and the word, and the logos, and the plan, and the self-expression of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. Somebody ought to say thank you, Jesus. And truth. You see, they they go together there, you see. Because grace caused him to put himself in flesh, Brother David. Grace, because grace is the unmerited favor of God. Because I couldn't build a high enough tower. I couldn't do enough good deeds. I couldn't make friends with enough of the right people. I could not give enough in the offering plate. I couldn't wear a nice enough suit or nice enough shoes. I couldn't give enough to enough people. I needed grace. Now, just hang with me. I'm going to get done. You 
You see, verse 14 is where it all comes together. You see, I'm teaching you about the doctrine of Jesus Christ. But you got to know him. Before you can be reconciled to him. And you've got to understand what he did for us with regard to the sin problem. Look here. John bear witness of him. Bear witness of who? Jesus Christ. That's who we're talking about. That's who created the world, who was in the world. The world didn't know him. John, John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I speak. He that come after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now you can go to the book of uh, Luke, the book of Matthew, and you find out very clearly that John was born six months before Jesus. But John said he was preferred before me because he was before me. Look here. Oh, Lord. Everything John preached had Jesus in it. Jesus was the text and the subject of John's ministry. He unapologetically preached Jesus Christ. Mark, Matthew 3 and 11, Mark 1, 7 and 8, Luke 3, 16, and right here, John 1, 15, and they repeated in Acts 13 and 25, Jesus is coming. I'm just telling you about him. Look here, verse 16. And of his fullness have all we received. I looked that up, and it means from his fullness have all we received. What do you think he's talking about right here? For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And from his fullness or out of his fullness we have all received. He's talking about the Holy Ghost. Talking about the revelation of who he is. Revelation of what he is and what he does. But look here. And we got grace for grace. Here's what that means. We went from old covenant grace to new covenant grace. Here's how I better can explain it. That's what kept you and I when we didn't care about the Lord. We didn't love the Lord. We weren't looking for the Lord. We didn't even really believe in the Lord. But grace was there anyway. And ignorant grace, I did this one other time. Yeah. You go down to the law of blessings for good. Yep. Yep. There you go. There you go. You see, it wasn't because you had a fast car that you got out of that trouble. It was the grace of God that got you out of that trouble. It wasn't because you had big muscles or you had a bigger gun. It was the grace of God that was with you. But now, this grace, Brother Billy, that's taken me from where I was to where he wants me to be. And when I think I can't make it, I have to remember about the grace that was with me when I was stupid. And Brother Blake, if he was going to cut me loose, he had plenty of opportunity to cut me loose back in the day. But Sister Casey ain't out here right now, but she sings that song and I love it. God's mercy kept me. So I couldn't let go. I wanted to. I wanted to, but he kept me. And of his fullness, from his fullness, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have a cheap imitation. We don't have a generic experience. We don't have a shallow experience. But what we feel in this room, what is living inside of us, is out of his fullness. It is not a, it's not partial. It's not a little bit, but it's from his fullness. 
That's why there's so many who live beneath their privilege. Because they're operating out of lack rather than full. Look here. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The only way that you and I can ever know God is through Jesus Christ. Let me finish real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 through 11 in the New Living Translation. And somehow the other, Sister Heidi, I left off 8, 9, 10, and 11, so you don't have to help me. Maybe the Lord don't want me to have that. Look here. This is Paul writing, who during the epistles and most of the book of Acts, or the first part of the book of Acts, Paul was against this. But on the road to Damascus, he has made a believer. Look here. Paul said to the Corinthian church, can somebody tell me what's going on in Corinth? While Paul is writing these letters, do y'all remember? What does it mean when they told people you live like a Corinthian? Do y'all remember that? That was a messed up place. When they said you live like a Corinthian, mean you was the lowest of the low with regard to morals. Y'all remember, this is the place that they had prostitutes in church. Y'all remember this? Okay. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness has made this light Shine in our hearts. I don't know. I don't know. You got to see it. The same God who said, think about that, Sister Lee Ann. How big the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. Same for God who said, Let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our heart so, so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Somebody said, "Woo! I love it. That's what I'm thinking right now. Woo! Look here. Sin caused us to fall short of the glory. For all have sinned and come short in the glory of God. Do you know what Jesus did? He built a bridge. That each one of us can cross over. So we could return to the glory. Do you know what the glory is? The exhibition of the excellence of God. So sin stole it from us. Sin took it from us. Sin messed it up. But sin ain't that powerful. You want to know why? Because Jesus came. The light came. And the darkness couldn't stop it. Here, let me just read the word and we'll get on. This is in the New Living now. And it's going to sound a little different. We now have this light shining in our hearts. But we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. And I want somebody to just see if it's starting to sink in right now. Maybe I won't go any further because if we get this, this is b -b 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 bad. <laughs> Look here. There is no, we can preach. We can teach, we can tell, we can yell. But the greatest example of Jesus active in our lives, Brother Derek, is we are jacked up, tore up from the flow up, and he loves us anyway. We are fragile Dirt jars. And we have this great treasure in us. And it's that, Brother Blake, that testifies. Because it makes it clear to everybody. Let me tell you what. 
And please forgive me. Please forgive me if this sounds disrespectful because it's not intended to be disrespectful. But you read this scripture and you think about how many years we destroyed our wounded. And when somebody was stupid in the church, we ostracized them and we judged them and we pushed them aside and we made them feel less than. And we missed out on the greatest testimony of the grace of God in restoring somebody who stepped out, who messed up, who fell down, who went out and was stupid. He put the Holy Ghost in our corruptible vessel. He knew who he was filling up when he baptized you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. He knew your strengths, but he also knew your weaknesses. And he was not intimidated by your failures, past, present, or future. That makes it clear. This fragile vessel, being the keeper of the treasure, makes it clear that our great power doesn't come from us, that it comes from God. It comes from God. It comes from God. Give me verse 8. Let's work on it just a little. We're pressed. Woo! We got pressures coming from every side by trouble, but we're not crushed. We can't wrap our mind around everything that's going on, but we're not in despair. We've not given up hope. We're not downhearted. We're not downtrodden. But Brother Ronnie, they that wait upon the Lord, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We may be not seeing so clearly. But the sun's coming up in the morning. His anger endureth but for a moment. And his favor is light. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. Next verse. We are hunted down. My daddy used to say this. When the devil's after you, you better rejoice because that means he ain't got you. We're hunted down. We're on the run sometimes, but we've never been abandoned by God. We get knocked down. But we're not destroyed. Look at here. Look at here. Look at here. Look at here. Through suffering. Oh, Holy Ghost. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus. So that there's a purpose to it. There's a reason behind it. So that. The life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Because, Brother Shannon, if I'm riding high, if I'm standing in the victor circle, if I've got all the money, if I've got all the women, if I've got all the trucks, the houses, and the lands, where's room for Jesus? But when I go through some stuff, and I ain't got two pennies to rub together, and I ain't got much going on. They're going to see Jesus then. Next verse and I'm done. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus. And here's what the Holy Ghost told me to say. If you're not always under attack, you better be worried. Because that means you haven't done anything to catch the devil's attention. Yes, we live under constant danger of death. Brother Burns, you well know it. Can't stand it. A 
up at 3 in the morning, up at 4 in the morning, walking the floors, thinking of everything everybody's going through, thinking of this one who's not doing right and, and this one who's not seeing their calling and, and this one, and I can't go over there and slap them and shake them, and, and I can't, I, I just got to pray, and I just got to pray over my town, and I got to pray over my people, and, and we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus. So that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. Think of it from the perspective of Calvary as I wind it up. It looked like the enemy won. Jesus was bleeding. Jesus was bruised. Jesus was battered. Jesus had been abandoned. Jesus had been mocked. He had been ridiculed, and it looked like hell won. When they hung him high, and they stretched him wide, they nailed his hands to that cross, and they drove it in the hole in the ground. They nailed through his hands and feet, and they stretched him to the maximum that the human body could stand. And it looked like hell was winning. And before they ever got to break his legs, Brother Blake, his old body had already give up. So they shoved the spear in his side. And I don't have time to preach about the victory that was in that. When blood and water that bears record came forth. And it looked like he's dead. And everybody that was watching went and locked herself in a room and hid. Because what do we do now? We've lost our connection. We've lost our revelation. A couple of bold men came and took him down off that tree, Brother David, dead. Rigor mortis perhaps sitting in, stiff, lifeless, blood caked to him. They wrapped him tenderly and put him in a coffin. Put, I mean, put him in a tomb, not a coffin, in a tomb. They put the stone in front because they planned on him staying. How quickly, how quickly, because it looked like to everybody he's going through a struggle and he lost. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, came Mary bearing spices. And when she got there, the stone was rolled back. And there sat an angel. And he said, why seek ye the living? Among the dead. He ain't here. He's risen. Amen. Honey, you're going to come out of your trouble. You're going to come out of your mess. You're going to come out of your struggle. Because he's already been there. And he's already come through it. And he's already paid the price. And he said, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. And now revelation is flowing in this room. And I don't understand everything that's going, but I know who's got the answer. I don't understand everything that's happening, but I know who's got the answer. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith as you stand in the house tonight. Let's lift our hands up and magnify the Lord. Thank him for his word. We love you, Jesus. 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 Oh. This whole song's been in my mind. My, my wife don't have to play it because I don't sing in a key that's on that board, but it says... Rock of ages, cleft 
for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure <laughs> and make me pure. Jesus, hallelujah. Glory and honor and praise and majesty to the King. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming. Don't forget our announcements. The envelope, see Sister Meredith. Sunday, bring a nice offering for Brother Jerry and Sister Judy. I, I, I've been practicing a speech, but I ain't giving it. I, I'm just not giving it. Just not giving it. I know that's my mama, but not only is am I her son, I'm her pastor. And Brother Jerry and my mama are a blessing to this church. And we're going to be a blessing to them in their time of trouble. Amen. So Sunday morning, please bring an offering. You can give on Givelify, whatever. It'll all go to them. Brother Blake's going to be preaching. I think about changing my mind about that based on what I feel in the house tonight. <laughs> but I've already put him off one time. Brother Blake, Sister Katie, you going to be here? Okay. He needs you here. Ain't God good to us? Sister Burns, I don't know how often you'll be here or when you'll be here, but make yourself at home. We love you. You honored us by being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Brother Johnny, close us out in prayer, brother.